Hey, Expeditioners, it's Peter Waitzman, founder of Expedition Money. In order to be successful managing a team, we need to go back to the fundamentals. And my friends, Scott Albrecht and Dr. Elliot Jarden, wrote a book on how to master the foundation of leading a team. I invited them to discuss some of the details of the book and offer up some tips for helping us get better at inspiring our team. We're stoked to talk about what you guys get going on. The messages you have in your book here resonated a lot with me because I get to see people in the workplace and team struggles and all those things. I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but if we can go back, yep. Scott, I've known you a while. I was wondering if maybe you could introduce yourself and introduce your uh, colleague here and just kind of tell us about you guys. Yeah. Thank you so much for having us on the podcast, Peter. You and I go way back and it always has to do with podcasts. So my first podcast was an ice fishing podcast. I've been on Team USA. I have ice fish in Latvia, Bulgaria, and Ukraine. And I'm in the leadership world. I get to consult hundreds of companies on team building. Thank you for the introduction and having me on here. So my background is in human performance, things like attention and memory. And my background is in neuroscience. So that's what my research has been in. And throughout my entire career, I've been interested in how to get the most out of people. The majority of my work is focused on older adults and cognitive changes that occur with them. And with that, I learned a lot about how the human mind works and some of the things that drives humans to, to be who they are. And some of the things that I study and I'm interested in include attention, memory, but also things that are more applicable in this setting, like motivation and what it takes to get the most out. And when I was doing a podcast on learning and development, which is tied in deeply to things like memory and attention. And I was on a webinar with Dr. Elliot Jardin, and he was talking about neuroscience. And, and I, I connected with him because he was in Ohio and I'm in Ohio. And I said, hey, I'd love to learn more about your brain. So I had him on our podcast, the Credit Union Leadership Podcast, a podcast that you frequented, Mr. Peter. And because the content that, was always amazing. Scott reached out via LinkedIn and we decided we had a lot of stuff in common and he had a lot of really good ideas. And he asked me to substantiate them, to, to look into research literature to show that not only do these ideas make sense, but what else can we add that research has done in a laboratory and outside of the laboratory to make this book stronger? And through this collaboration, the book came and yeah, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a great journey and I really hope that helps people. And I've always wanted to write a book, but I never had the topic, right? It's, I didn't want to sit there and try to write something that I didn't have the topic for. And I remember distinctly, I was sitting with a friend over coffee in Phoenix, Arizona, which by the way, the last place you probably want to drink a hot cup of coffee is in Phoenix, Arizona. But the whole concept just came together in my head. And I said, Patrick Linioshi's five dysfunctions of a team is in a triangle, right? And Maslow's hierarchy of needs is in a triangle. What if we just took two triangles and we merged them? And that's the book. And I said, if I publish this on my own, it'd be good, but it wouldn't be great. And from that, we formed a relationship. We had, again, coffee. This whole book was written over coffee. <laughs> and uh, we had great, co amazing coffee in Miami, Ohio. And I think I just needed Dr. Elliot Jardin to be on board. And a week later, we had a published book. Love it. And in fact, I have the physical copy here. And since coffee has been such a big theme, what's everyone's preferred drink here? Yeah. Since I've, I've been to Italy, we got an espresso machine at the house. My wife and I, we decided to, to make the splurge and we drink that almost every day, whether it be a cappuccino or, or an espresso. Yeah, either one of those are, are my go-to. How about yourself? I've been into the flat whites lately, a little milk in there and no, it just it's decadent to me, but maybe I shouldn't go that route on coffee. The espressos, that's where the punches get, get me going a little bit. But Scott, man, you must have frequented a lot of coffee shops. Got a favorite? It was funny. I was in Phoenix and I, I thought my order was somebody else's order. And he said, oh. and the whole staff said, no, this is Matt's order because Matt gets coconut milk and Matt gets cinnamon on top and Matt has this and this. And so it made such a big deal out of it that I went and got my real cup of whatever it was, vanilla latte, sugar-free vanilla latte. And then out of curiosity, I went back to Matt and I was like, so what's in, what's in your coffee? And he gave me the, the order. He gave me the list. And that's been my order ever since. So it's actually the, the same coffee shop in Phoenix that the book originated at. 
that's the order that I've used ever since. Love it. When you find something that works, man, just to stick with it. The book is called Hierarchy of Team Needs. And could you guys just explain what's in this book and what the book is about? Yeah. So I've gotten a chance to interview some really, you would call successful people from a worldly standpoint. So Ken Coleman, Patrick Kelly, and they describe that mountaintop moment as one where you get a renewed perspective on life when you're at the top of a mountain. Meaning when you're going up the mountain, all you can see is the mountain, right? When you're on the bottom and you're looking up, you can only see the mountain. When you get to the top of the mountain, you see other mountains. So you finally have perspective of where you are at in life, what special strengths you bring to your certain situation, and what does that give you? It gives you purpose. This is my mountain, okay? I'm not trying to climb somebody else's mountain. I know why I am on this mountain and I know why they're on that mountain. And I know my specific purpose and relevance and meaning here. I know exactly what I contribute and where I need help to contribute. And that's just a a mountaintop moment. But I will will add something that's really important that's in the book. If you ask me about what's in the book, you cannot build this pyramid without a cornerstone, right? So if you build this pyramid on rocky ground and there's no cornerstone, there's no foundation, the whole thing's going to crumble. And so you have to have a North Star mission statement for your team that holds this entire structure up, right? So when we're going to build trust, we've got to tell people why. Because our mission is to X, Y, and Z. When we go to create an honest feedback iterative loop, the reason is because to live out our mission, we need to be able to be honest with each other, right? So the entire structure depends on an overarching greater good, a greater cause, a call to a higher calling, if you will, than individual need. It's a call to not put a self over the team, but to put team over self. It's a call for lower self-consciousness through applied pressure. Because what's good for the goose is not good for the gander. And this is a gander book, guys. (laughs) It's a gander book. And if we take care of the gander, then the goose is going to get to their highest point of self-actualization. So it's the opposite of what you think is going to happen. If I take care of myself, I'll get to the peak of the precipice. No, if you take care of yourself, it's just going to be you in a room alone by yourself. Could you imagine if Elon Musk never had a team? He'd still be in his room thinking about what's possible, right? You need a team to be able to go further. You can go faster than the team. Oh, you can definitely go faster, but you can go further with a team than you'll ever be able to go by yourself. This definitely seems like a corporate book. And did you see a need to get this type of message out to the people that you connect with a lot? Because mm-hmm. this is pretty specific. I think feel like there's a lot of practical and actionable and relevant information in here. But why come out with this message? right now? So many of the clients that I help with problems, there's a surface level problem under the problem. So they're coming at me with a symptom and they say, we need to solve the symptom. But the real problem is the the surface layer underneath the symptom. And so I'll give you an example. Maybe they're not getting accountability done. I hear that a lot. But really, there's not a place for honest feedback. So the employees don't feel safe to voice an opinion one way or the other. So when the goal of 500 whatevers is given, there's no consensus. There's no buy-in on, oh, this is why the goal is this. And so when the employees don't hit the goal, it's because there's a lack of vision. And that comes from a lack of honesty. And that comes from a lack of trust, honestly. So if you have a problem, you got to figure out, is this the actual problem or is this a symptom? And this book gives you that surface layer need that may not be addressed that's creating the symptom. And Dr. Elliot, I wanted to ask you, you talked about unlocking that potential that people have. Why do people either lock that up or do they want to unlock it? Or is that like a corporate thing where we want to get more out of our people? Yeah, I think that in general, people like to perform at their highest potential, best quality. And To get that, unfortunately, I think corporate America sometimes misses the message on how to achieve that. To take a step back, you have to Mm -hmm. think about the person, what they want, and what their goals are. And as a leader, it's really your job to set them up in a way to pursue their hobbies and interests, to further the company, to make it a better company, while putting them in a place to grow and learn and become better. And ways to think about that are to 
line up what the field of psychology calls intrinsic motivation, which is the joy of doing something just to do it with also extrinsic motivation, which is seeking rewards and things like raises and, and promotions. So it's all about setting someone up in a situation where they enjoy what they're doing. One, two, they're able to grow and have better career prospects. And three, that it's done in somewhat of an autonomous way where it's not being micromanaged. So they're able to be creative and go on the routes that they want. And if you're able to hit those three bars, you're setting yourself up for a lot of success. Interesting. What kind of inertia are you guys working against to change the discussion here or change the things that companies are thinking about? Yeah. So sometimes it just helps to have a clear picture of, of what's needed. I think this brings in that framework that is an ideal picture that you can remember. Yeah, everyone remembers Mathwell's hierarchy of needs. And so it's easy for a team leader to look at this diagram and just it's a checkbox list. Do I have these things? The answer to your question, though, is you have to apply pressure at each layer of the, the pyramid. That's how pyramids stay together, by the way, right? If one stone was loose, we wouldn't see pyramids thousands of years later. So the pressure of the actual need is important, like a keystone. Like the keystone is the pressure that holds the rest of the door frame together. And so pressure, stress, it sounds like a bad word in work environments, right? Stress is always connotated with negative associations. And part of this book came from my family, seeing family members go through mental disorders and having older ages and going through dementia and doing some research on some things that you can do to, for prevent, preventative measures, right? A, an ounce of prevention is better than a cup of the cure. And there was just tons of science out there about applied pressure and stress. And you should go into a sauna and put your body through stress. And it was combating this word association that leaders have with this word stress. And so one of the things, the concepts of, of this book is, yeah, let's give them the layers of need that a team can use to succeed that's been proven for years and I've seen work myself. But also let's reconsider conceptualize this term stress and applied pressure and realize when I mean, you hire somebody, you, you got to start over with the team trust. Like you have to apply pressure on trust. Maybe trust falls aren't really workplace appropriate. Somebody might break a, an arm or something like that, a worker's comp claim or something. But a strengths finders assessment is probably a good idea for someone who's new on a team, especially if the team's relatively small. If the organism changed about 12% or more, you've got a new organism by the, by the definition of what an organism is. And so we have a new team. We've got to go back to that first layer. And too many leaders who have been short staffed for seven months and see the new person finally here, we can finally take PTO. We can finally go on vacation. And so they throw them into the fire. And then the team starts to say, well, who's this new guy? right? Who moved my cheese? Why, why are they doing this? Why the last person didn't do that? And then it just creates dysfunction, right? It creates a lack of trust. And then the rest of the recipes start to break. So that, that's where we bring in that Patrick Lineoshi research. What can go wrong when you don't work on trust? What can go wrong when you don't have honest feedback? What can go wrong when you don't have a, a rallying cry around the vision statement? And it's just so interesting that the safety needs are, are met in the first bottom two layers going to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We're not talking about providing a roof over someone's head or food, but to feel safe in the workplace, I got to trust my leader. To feel safe in the workplace, I've got to feel like I'm honest with somebody. Here's an interesting thing that's not in the book. Gallup did a, a research correlation study on one question. Do you have a best friend at work? And the correlation of people and their retention level, if they answered no to that question, versus yes to that question was like 0.76, which in the lens of corollaries, that's a huge correlation, right? If I have a best friend at work, there's a 0.76 correlation with me keeping my job. And if I don't have a best friend at work, I have a 0.7, I think it was 0.74 correlation with like lack of retention. And when they dug into, okay, that's a weird question. Are we supposed to have best friends at work? When they dug into what the science said about that question, the emotive response to that question was more of a, do I have someone I can confide in? Do I feel safe enough to be able to tell the truth to some person at work 
It's that honest feedback safety layer that leads you to the psychological needs in rallying around a mission statement, the psychological needs of knowing what the expectation of me at work is, getting coached when I do well, getting redirected when I need to improve, and that leads to accountability, right? And then once those psychological needs are met, then we hit the peak of the precipice, and that's the peak of the pyramid. That's the self-actualization and and mass hierarchy of needs. And, And for a team, that's where we can start to raise the bar on expectations. Okay, you met our minimum expectation in that fourth bar. In the fifth bar, we're gonna start to move to your potential. I wanna get you in this book to a place where you can call your leader and say, I'm so close to potential. If I reached out, I could touch it. And that's a place in my heart that I want every person in the, in the world to experience because I personally have made that call to my leader. And, and it's such a good feeling to be on top of the mountain and to not be looking up the mountain at needs that are unmet. I love it. I love the mountain iconography as well. I want to come back to trust because I really want to talk about that because I think a lot of times we gloss over, say, the foundational pieces, the fundamental pieces. And I feel like that's a big thing in your book. I love that you hit on it, but I'd love to back up here just a minute. How much are we talking about job satisfaction in this book? It seems like the things that you're talking about, to me, it's almost like you're saying, hey, if you find a team that has these things, Pete, you are going to be in nirvana. You're going to love what you're doing. You're never going to leave. Elliot can speak to this. This is where that whole point of intrinsic motivation comes. So how how does the human brain react to being on a team that's high performing, right? That's what we're trying to get to. Why why is a team book something that somebody that's on a team or a part of a team, why should they pick that up? Why should they care about the team succeeding? How does that impact their workplace performance? Am I satisfied at work because I'm on a good team or am I satisfied at work because they gave me a fitness center and a yoga room? and free coffee on Fridays. So what's the correlation between engagement and being on a highly successful team? What are your thoughts on this intrinsic, extrinsic motivation? Yeah, so there's a lot of things you could do to have people and enjoy their time at work. And some of them can be really helpful in the long term, and some can be be nice, but they could seem like gimmicks. And one of the things that, that we do find is that Intrinsic motivation, enjoying what you're doing is one of the best predictors of success and job satisfaction. It is not something that goes away quickly. It's something that is durable, line long lasting. Whereas a type of extrinsic motivation might be reaching a certain goal. And once that goal is reached, okay, what's the next goal? We need something else. But if you find someone that really loves doing what they're doing, and more importantly, as a leader, you're asking a question. How can I put people in a role where they're going to love what they're going to do instead of saying, how can I get someone to work as hard as they can doing what I want them to do? If you're able to rephrase the question, you're able to not only have people reach their potential, but have them enjoy doing it. It's interesting that the University of Alabama has really good recruiting and it's not because they have free coffee on Fridays. It's because it's a winning team. And winning individuals want to work for winning coaches and they want to win. They want to perform well. You know, when we don't have these needs met, your top performers are going to go find another team to work on. So so finding the team's needs is finding the individual's needs. That's why in Phoenix, Arizona, over a hot cup of coffee, I was ecstatic at the idea of combining these two concepts because they mesh so well. To achieve a team's peak is to achieve an individual's peak. It helps to be on a winning team. Yeah, I totally agree. And I feel like from my perspective, and I started in corporate America, I ended up working in corporate America for 20 years before I went on my own. But I feel like I personally got the benefit of working on some really great teams and some really dysfunctional teams, to be honest. And as I was going through your book, it seemed to make sense that in your hierarchy of needs, that there are some things that fundamentally we were missing on the teams that were dysfunctional. And as I was looking at this, I feel like a lot of times we just look at, say, symptoms, things that aren't working well, but what we often have to do is back up and kind of get some of the basics in place instead of sometimes I feel like I've been in a situation or I've seen situations where the issue is thought to be communication 
but it's really a values discussion about trust. Like you said, Scott, having that space where you feel safe and you feel like you can have a discussion. And if you don't have that, maybe every communication feels like an affront to someone else or hypercritical feedback or a place where someone's going to get fired or something. But what happens in a team where maybe you're following all these business rule books and yet you're missing that trust? Yeah. That, so let me unpack that question because there's two questions in that question, right? So how does trust and honest feedback play together? What's the importance of trust? So I'm going to give the honest feedback to Elliot piece. I'll cover the first and then I'll give the honest feedback to Elliot because Elliot will keep me honest on that one. So the first piece is imagine you're a brand new manager and they hired you because you were an outstanding individual contributor. You were fantastic. You were the best at processes. You're the best at systems. You're the best at everything. They called you the queen of the castle for a reason, because you knew your stuff. And they're like, who's the best person for this next manager role? This person. And you get in there and you start making changes and you say, you're doing what? How much does that cost? How much time are you spending on this process? Did you know that we could do this or that? And they're right. They are spending too much over here. They are spending too much money over there. And they're wrong because you can never go faster than the speed of trust. So let me break this down for you in a definition that's more of like an algebraic equation. I define leadership as having followers. Simply put, if you're a leader, turn around. Are people following you? Yes or no? If it's yes, congratulations, you're a leader. So it's outside of the role of manager, because I know many managers who aren't leaders because they don't have followers because they move too fast. They move faster than the speed of trust. So how do I build followership? Well, if I don't know you, I don't trust you. And if I don't trust you, I'm not going to follow you. That's the equation. If I don't know you, I don't trust you. And if I don't trust you, I can't follow you. So if I'm going to be a leader, I need followers, which means I need to get to know my team and they need to get to know me. And how you do that, up to you. I like ordering lunch. And the only rule is we can't talk about work. That's how you learn about Lucy's kid in gymnastics or somebody else getting married. You're like, I didn't know you're getting married. Yeah. Second marriage coming up this weekend. Who knew Bob was getting married? We did not know Bob was getting married, but you got some chicken wings and we talked about everything but work. And that's team building. That's building trust. That's getting to know people. Let me give you an outside of work example. If I'm pumping gas and I just got done doing a public speaking engagement, which by the way, if you want to book us for public speaking engagements, Elliot and I would love to speak at your upcoming conferences. And somebody comes up to me, I typically wear red shoes and a red belt because it stands out and it's fun. And if somebody came up to me and they said, Scott, that red belt just doesn't match your, the rest of your outfit. I don't think it's really on par with your brand. The first two things I would ask myself is, have you been to one of my leadership training sessions? Or do you plan to go to future leadership training sessions? Because if the answer to those two things are no, I don't know you. I don't trust you. And I'm not going to trust your recommendation. Be like a stranger in the airport saying, have you listened to this murder mystery podcast? I'm not going to trust the recommendation. So if you're a new leader and you're seeing all of the things that you could fix right off the bat, go do some team building first. <laughs> so go build some trust on your team first, because otherwise you're going to be pulling them, dragging, kicking and screaming the entire time. Because you know what? A leader's job is to lead change in people who typically, typically don't want to be changed. That's, a, that's my other definition of leadership that's more tongue in cheek. The, the, the definition of, of what you're supposed to do when you get paid the big bucks to be a manager is the lead change in others that don't want to change, likely. So how do you get someone to have that motive, that internal intrinsic motivation to move in a different direction than they're currently moving? How do you get someone external motivation it's through applied pressure. But the best way to start is with trust. Honest feedback is to Elliot. Honest feedback is one of the most important ways to grow. And you're not going to care about someone's feedback if you don't trust them. So let me tell a couple of stories related to, to my life and honest feedback and, and how to get better. So one example, I'm a competitive chess player. And to reach the highest levels, there's no way to do it unless you lose thousands of times and you analyze and you learn how to get better. And if you want to speed it up, you ask someone better where you made those mistakes and, and they'll tell you and it'll speed up your process. I also played football 
after every game, we'd watch film. And, and when we watch film, they tell you what you're doing, what you're doing wrong, and you do your best to improve. Also, an- another link, when you look at many martial arts, one of the customs that is common is that you bow to each other. And the reason you do that is you're giving them respect and you're saying, thank you for exposing my weaknesses. Let me work on my weaknesses and let me train to become better today. And with this mindset, you're able to grow to a level that you're not able to if you don't push yourself, if you don't have that level of commitment, and if you're not willing to make mistakes. As a leader, it's important to say that I'm going to do my best to help you grow and my feedback isn't to hurt you. It's to help lead you towards the direction that we agree that you want to go, that we previously have agreed to. And it's all about that. It's all about a method to improve. And it's, it's a difficult one. It's one that honest feedback is, can be a real struggle. Like we're not robots, we're humans. And with that comes a lot of complexities. And the way that you give feedback is critical, but it's for the ultimate goal of reaching whatever milestone you want to get to, whether it's the, the top of a mountain or something else. Dr. Elliot Jor- Jordan, you, you also have a, a side hustle in languages. Wouldn't you agree that debate and feedback is just a a gift of the human language. Like just the fact that I can share an opinion and you can say, yeah, Scott, thank you for that. And I agree with this piece, but have you considered this piece? And I'm like, I I didn't even think about that, but I still think it's this. And you're like, yeah, but if it's this, you know, can, can you imagine what it would look like if this happened? You got a point there. Like debate class, for those of you that participated in high school, I did not. I missed out. I I wish I would have because it's a gift of language to be able to have this healthy back and forth of what the best possible, most efficient process would look like. And I'm talking like peer to peer, employee to manager to employee. Dr. Elliot Jarden in the book described it as an iterative loop. We're always asking for feedback and it's it's omnidirectional throughout the entire organization. How are we doing as a team? How am I doing as an employee? How am I doing as a manager? And that can only be established with trust, right? First of all, I feel like don't the best organizations have open and honest feedback with each other? Get into a conversation with your team, bring some ideas, shoot some ideas down, pull coals in them, double down on great ideas. And when you have that trust and that safe environment, it's okay. Everyone knows that you're not a techie me, you're, you might be criticizing an idea. And I feel like I've been on some of those teams where, man, we make some great progress because we flush out a bunch of different options. On the other hand, I've been on some teams where the priority is just to be very supportive of everyone, not make anyone's idea feel criticized. And in those cases, I feel like you don't move at all. You're just stuck in this feedback loop. And so I think this is really important. I was wondering if you could maybe elaborate a little bit more on why the the continuous improvement cycle is so important. Mm -hmm. And for the organizations that haven't seen this or don't really think about this, what should they be doing? Yeah. In the book, I I describe it as you got to be able to answer four questions and get honest answers from your team on those four questions. So if they don't trust you, they're not going to answer these four questions well, or they they might not answer it at all. So you got to build trust and then you can ask these four questions. Where do we want to be in the future? What's our dream state, right? Like, where, what's the most ideal state that we possibly could be in? And you got to let the team like whiteboard that out. What's possible? What do you guys want to do that we're not doing today? And initially, you might have some people that are like slow to the pickup on what we're trying to accomplish. Maybe they give you like a short set. I'm talking like, I want to cast a vision that's big, that's bold, that's beautiful. And it's not our current reality. It's not just keep on keeping on. It's no, we can be so much better. And I want the team to talk through that. What does that look like? What does that future reality look like? And then parallel that with where are we at today, right? Because now I've got a gap, right? I know where we want to be. I know where the gap is. And now as a team, we can start walking through, how do we get there? How do we get to a point where we have the 0.1% error ratio? How do we get to the point where the most cost-effective product in our marketplace? Where do we get to the point where we're the number one in customer service? Where do we get to the point where our internal service survey rates us the top place in Dallas, Texas to work? That's where we want to get to. Where are we at today? What do we need to do to get there? 
And how do we know when we arrive? Those are the four questions that if you don't have trust, you can't get honest answers from. How do you know if maybe you need to go back to trust? I'll tell you. Do you work for a group of people who nod their heads like bobbleheads in the meeting? Oh yeah, boss. Oh, that's a good idea, boss. Oh yeah. Oh wow. That's a wow. That's a great, boss. Man, sliced bread in your face. Sliced bread is the best. Uh, man, is the best idea ever. And then right when the meeting's over, as they're walking out, they're like leaning over to each other. Hey, that's like the worst idea you ever heard, right? Yeah. No. Like I, I had no clue that our boss was that dumb. <laughs> So there's no room for honesty, right? It's an artificial harmony is, is how Patrick Lineoshi describes it, where how's our, everything going today? We're good. There's like smoke coming from the kitchen. Are you, you, guys, you sure you're good? Because I, I, I smell smoke. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're fine. We're, we're good, right? So Tim just threw a stapler at Sally. We're good. And, you know, where there's no honesty, where we all, yeah, we all just shake our head. Yeah, you're so good. And, and as a leader, you don't want that, right? As a leader, if you've got 10 ideas and nine of them need work, you want a team to say, hey, I love the direction you're going on this. I see where you're trying to go. I think it's the right direction. I think there's some things that we need to work on this one before we hit the green light. That's what you want a team to be able to say to you. Otherwise, you're going to be implementing some pretty bad ideas and they're going to fail. And you might even cost the company some money and you might even cost yourself your job because you didn't have a team that could actually deliver really honest feedback. To your point, Peter, I've worked on some really high performance teams that have won a lot of awards. And I was really surprised the amount of like family feel like Thanksgiving where like Uncle Bob says, pass the mashed potatoes. And it like turns into this huge fight. And then everyone's like, hey, you want to grab a beer afterwards? (laughs) Yeah. Like we feel so safe with each other that it almost feels like a family. There's a family feel where I know I can tell my brother like, hey, man, you probably should shave that beard. You're looking homeless. Just saying, you might get food stuck in your beard, bro. Like I can say that to him and we can still go play football after Thanksgiving dinner because we have that safety, that psychological and that familial safety. And I think in team environments, it's critical to have a safe environment to be able to give honest feedback. And Elliot has some things to say about it as well. He's still on the podcast. He did not drop off. You just, you gave me a mic and that's a mistake, Peter. You just never asked me a question. Just I was just saying, think of all the options. Sometimes the quietest people have the right answer. That's right. Uh, Elliot, he's, I'm like way smarter than Scott. Just ask me a question. Come on, man. Bring it. <laughs> oh, no, not at all, man. So, I got like, him on the book for a reason. He's the brains. He's the brains. I'm just the smiling guy. Yeah. So Scott plays himself down as not being an expert. But yeah, he's been training companies for years now, hundreds of them. So you don't have to get like a special degree or different letters to be an expert in something. So just because I went to school for attention and neuroscience doesn't make me the expert and leadership and how to build trust, because that's not something I've spent as much time with. I do have a research lab where I work with them and I'm a leader in this. I send them off in their directions and I I try to get the most out of them. And I I do follow these same core principles to a T where build trust, give, give them feedback when necessary. But really my goal is to align their motivations with what they want. And a lot of times it's either to go to grad school or get a good job after. So I do what I can to set them up for that. And yeah, certainly w- without trust, you're building on a foundation that, that doesn't exist and it will soon crumble. So with any pressure, with, with any stress, without the cornerstones, pretty soon you're going to have a lot of bricks and no pyramid. Yeah. And to talk about the visioning again, because we need the vision in terms of some direction, even if it's not a crystal clear vision, because I feel like personally, the process of constant improvement that I use felt good, felt satisfying because I generally knew what I wanted to do. It wasn't just creating work. I feel a little bit like when I had been in work environments where we've been very busy, but we haven't necessarily had a specific outcome and you're just working, I almost feel dejected because, yeah, we're so busy, but why? What's the point? Do we hunger for direction? Does that give us intrinsic love of the work that we're doing? If it's more guided by a a grander purpose or an objective like that? Yeah. So I I can take that. So in in a general sense, if you're doing the task and and you don't enjoy it, then likely you have low intrinsic motivation because you're not doing it just because you love it. Whereas with external motivation, it sounds like you're not high on that either because you don't think you're achieving any kind of real goal. You think that it's a waste of time. In this case, it seems like you'd be low on both internal and external motivation, which is really tough. That's where burnout comes from. 
sometimes it's necessary, but you want to avoid that if at all possible. I feel like the burnout discussion has come up a lot lately. And I even feel like a little bit like remote work has been a bit of an antidote to try to quell that. But I've actually been talking to a lot of people that have been talking about burnout. Maybe it's because I'm in my forties and maybe a lot of me and my peers hit this point, but I'm curious, would people on a team that say that they are struggling with burnout, would that be an indicator that team or environment has not mastered the hierarchy of team needs? Is that an indicator of that, or is it an indicator of something else or something more personal? Is I can take that. So Gallup used burnout and quiet quitting for the first time in their research, I think last year. I, I've been a huge fan of Gallup for 20 years. I love Gallup. I, I read their stuff all the time. So I think it's a term that's always been around. We just called it different things. It used to be called disengagement. It used to be referred to as people who are either actively disengaged, they'd be your burnt out people, or disengaged, which is your people who are quietly quitting. So what's the difference between quietly quitting and burnt out? Quietly quitting, you probably have one of those two motivations still working. Burnt out is both are off. And so I am going to pass it down to, to Elliot Jardine. What's going on in the brain when I don't have cortisone? I don't have adrenaline. I don't have knee adrenaline, right? I need that stuff. I need my brain to be firing on neurons. When that's not happening, describe like how that attributes to, to burnout and, and maybe where this model can help somebody overcome that. Sure. So we're talking about, yeah, hormones and neurotransmitters like cortisol, norepinephrine. These are ones that are related to the stress response and the body lets these go in response to any kind of challenge. And it's important to note that on average, workers are too stressed and a lot of the stress can turn toxic. It can lead to issues with the immune system, with the cardiovascular system. So especially not wanting to put a blind eye to that. However, whatever you want to do, you want to to push yourself and have an adequate amount of challenge so that you feel like you've achieved an adequate amount of stress and, and challenge is necessary to arrive at that. And what research has showed is that when workers have a situation where motivation is low and that autonomy is low, this is one of the, the places where cardiovascular effects and immune system effects are, are the highest. So you want to avoid this whenever mm -hmm. possible. If you're hoping to have people achieve their goals, what they're hoping to, to get, you want to consider an environment where they're enjoying what they're doing, they're getting rewarded for what they're doing, and they have freedom of expression and creativity. So this is building a model that's a little bit different than what the traditional top-down model is, where the person in charge tells everyone what to do. A way to flip this is to discuss some of the main objectives that the business has. And then as a leader, ask those who are working for you what they would like to do, how they see they can help you achieve this goal, and how as a team we could come together. And if you have people doing what they want, what they love, it turns from being work to a passion. And when something is a passion, you're more likely to enter a flow state. So even if you're at a space where you're exerting a lot of energy, your, your stress hormones are higher. For the body, it doesn't have the same kind of toxic reaction that it does when you're feeling overstressed and you're not enjoying something. There, there's this differentiation in the literature between something that was called eustress, which is the positive way of going for something like a flow state, where essentially you're enjoying what you're doing, you're in the zone, and you're not feeling the negative effects. So in summation, the idea is you, you want to give people a, a situation where you can get the most out of them and that they enjoy it and it's something that they want to do. And if you could get all of those, you, you're in great shape. Make sure to ask people what they want to do too, because that's Love critical. It. I know we have only scratched the surface on this book. It's funny because the book isn't long. I feel like if you have a lunch break and you're grabbing some lunch and instead of surfing Instagram, you can absolutely pick this book up and read through it. But I feel like there is so much behind the words in this book. It makes me reflect a lot. It was actually hard to get through the book in a quick pass because I found myself putting it down a lot and just staring up into the sky and thinking about so many situations, right? It's like the book of Mark, right? We know Peter wrote the book of Mark and you read Luke and Matthew and it's, oh, and this happened. And Mark's, yeah, Peter, uh, Jesus got baptized and then he started doing miracles. <laughs> it's a quick hit. And, it, and we built it for that purpose. We, we wanted it to be a 45 minute read. 
playbook because Peter, here's something that nobody knows and I'm going to tease it on this podcast. There's a second edition to this book. It's going to be a lot longer. It's going to probably, for one page, every page is going to have four pages, but we're going to bring in a lot more meat. So thanks for having us on the podcast because this podcasting, keynoting, getting in front of leaders and, and sharing our book with them is how we're bringing in this science and baking out what that second edition looks like, which would be a lot more of a meteor read. What's the ultimate objective with this book? Are you trying to just make every work environment a healthy, productive, and fulfilling one? Who should benefit best from picking up this book? People who are hitting their head against the wall that can use reliable science that's been around for ages to get a clear concept and framework that has been proven to work. We don't have to go out and prove what Patrick Lenioshi did works. He did it. It works. We don't have to go out and prove that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a reliable source for things that work. He did it and it works and I've seen it work. And so it's taking these concepts and just making them understandable. I do underplay what I do for a living. I try to make really complex com- concepts easy to understand. That's my superpower. And I think that this book does just I love it. Yeah, I feel like there's a little bit of a paradox here because when I look back at those healthy team environments, if I were to give this book to everyone in those team, they have to be like, this is great. I want to read through this. Let's make ourselves better. I appreciate bringing this up. But on the teams that have struggled with a little bit of that honesty, I feel like I could give this book where we really need it to the people on the team. And they'd be like, what, do you think I'm not a trustworthy person? Do you think I don't? Give me feedback. Am I a bad leader? I'll I'll leave you with this. Trust is a lot like oxygen. I'm stealing this from somebody. There's a quote out there where it's trust is a lot like oxygen. When you have plenty of oxygen, you don't think about it. But when you don't have oxygen, you start thinking about it. Trust is the same way. I I know a team has low levels of trust when they start talking about trust, right? If you're talking about trust, it's probably because there's something going on there. If you're talking about oxygen, it's probably because there's something going on there. Where there's smoke, there's fire. And if a team's talking about trust in order uh, a lot in a pre-meeting with me, then I know this is probably the need that they need. A lot of sense. I love that you make this practical and bite-sized for people. Congrats, by the way. I appreciate coming on. Thanks for having us, man. Yeah, thanks so much. Expedition Money aims to help each individual take a meaningful step towards their financial dreams. And since each individual is unique, We offer an array of proven and novel resources, including financial health assessment, online courses, webinars, financial news updates, multi-week workshops, over 2,000 educational videos, over 1,000 financial articles, podcast, newsletter, low-cost financial coaching, free 24-7 virtual coach, goal tracking worksheets, financial calculators, basic legal documents, in-person training and retreats, community interaction, virtual co-working sessions, challenges, group trainings, adult education books, kids coloring books, kids storybooks, family games, and even more coming soon. So if you're looking for a comprehensive financial wellness program that might have the perfect tool for your most unique people, partner up with Expedition Money today.